So I've come to learn that any new thing, good thing, better thing, uh, a lot of times we don't realize it, but there's a huge backstory, kind of a prequel of all the work and effort and planning that went into getting to that point. Uh, I love the 9-11 memorial in New York City, been able to go there a couple of times, and uh, I love that the new One World Trade Center building, uh, that they built it to be exactly 1,776 feet tall in honor of the birth year of America. I thought that's really cool, neat little design. Well, here's what I learned. It, it was done in 2013, but the actual design of the building was accepted in 2003, 10 years from here's the design to here's the finished product. That's a long time. I've come to learn that that's how things can be a lot of times. I don't know how many of you all have been driving on Mount Zion Road lately. Uh, I know you probably love that road. Um, there's times when I make it almost like a game to see how much I can avoid Mount Zion Road, a new way to get to a place without ever having to drive on that road. But I will say, I've come to actually, I might be in a minority here, so don't boo me, I kind of like roundabouts, actually. <laughs> uh, I do, I mean, because if you time it right, I, I've driven on a few, there's a few in Highland Heights, and if you've ever been to Carmel, Indiana, I mean, that whole city's built on roundabouts, it's crazy, uh, so, and I kind of got lost on one once, but anyway, I think that, I think it's kind of good and new and different, uh, but I was actually going through some stuff in my office, and I had a file folder fr from a meeting that I attended eight years ago where we learned the scope of the new Highway 536. And I was like, oh, that's right. I remember going to this meeting, and I remember we learned how they were going to redo Mount Zion Road. And I thought, cool, I'm going to look and see if it looks like what they're doing right now. Well, what I didn't remember is that meeting eight years ago wasn't about that part of Mount Zion Road. It's about the other part that goes from Harris Pike in La Rosa's in Independence all the way deep into Campbell County, the part they've not even started yet. So there was probably another meeting like 20 years ago about what they're doing now, and I didn't get invited to that meeting. But that's what I'm learning is that any good thing, new thing, different thing, there's a lot that goes behind it. Uh, I was able to go visit family during uh, Christmas and made the drive down, and Sherry and I did, to visit my dad and stepmom down in Harlan County. They are big-time gardeners. I remember as a kid thinking, if I ever leave this place, I will never garden again. It was, I thought it was the worst thing ever. Now, I would, man, if, if I knew, if I had a place and my subdivision would allow it, maybe they do. I don't know. I need to look into this. But, man, that, that's some good eating right there. I mean, you can't replicate a green bean going from your backyard to a pot to your belly. It is that fresh. It is that good. And I love my, my stepmom's green beans. But here's what I know. I was down there visiting in July when they were harvesting those green beans, and it was a lot of work. Uh, and then, even before that, my dad had, um, he's overcome cancer, praise God, he's cancer-free, I'm so thankful for that. But he had a year where he had to take off from gardening, because he was in such poor health, he couldn't do it. As it turns out, there's a little uh, plant down in Harlan County called kudzu vine. It is a very invasive plant, and it just totally took over the garden in that one year that my dad took off from gardening. So I remember hearing my dad said, I mean, he like tied a chain around the vine and attached it to the back of the tractor and tried to pull it out. That didn't work. I mean, they went through some crazy stuff to get rid of all that kudzu vine so that then they could plow the ground, sow the seeds, and have a garden. But a lot of work went into it. And I really thought about that as I was thinking about what I wanted to share with you today because in essence, what my dad was doing and what gardeners do, what farmers do, is they, they monitor the correct conditions for growth. And I've heard my dad and my grandpa say over and over, yeah, they, they paid attention to the farmer's almanac. They paid attention to the weather. Interestingly enough, my stepmom even said, I've always heard you should let the soil rest a year after so many years. Well, we kind of got forced to do that, and we've had the best crop ever. Maybe that's something we should have been doing. There's a lot more that goes into growing. There's conditions. And I want to say this to you today. If I can uh, scroll to my right thing. <laughs> I'm going 
I'm going to read some passages in a minute that, that I think help us to understand this. Real growth depends on right conditions for growing. We can make wise choices now to create those conditions so that together we can grow deep and wide. And if I would name this sermon at all today, it would be those two words, deep and wide, deep and wide. I believe that's how you were meant to grow. I believe it's how we as a church are meant to grow. There's a, uh, an analogy in the Old Testament. It's sprinkled throughout it, and it's kind of odd. It's the cedars of Lebanon. That phrase is just sprinkled throughout the Old Testament. As it turns out, Lebanon was known for its cedar trees. They were highly sought after. In fact, David, King David in the Old Testament, his house was built from cedars from Lebanon. When his son Solomon was led by God to build a temple for the Lord, they used cedars from Lebanon to build that temple. Strong, aromatic cedars of Lebanon. And so you'll see sprinkled in the Old Testament that this analogy of that, that's a good thing. To be called, to be referred to as a cedar of Lebanon meant strength, it meant prosperity, it meant growth. One such passage is Psalm 92. I'm going to read to you verses 12 through 15. It says, The righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. They still bear fruit in old age. They are ever full of sap and green. To declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock. And there is no unrighteousness in him. I love this. I love this analogy that, that, that we are to be like a cedar of Lebanon, that we're planted in the presence of God, that he allows us to bear fruit in old age. Living things grow. We're always growing. We're always progressing, and we're bearing fruit, and that our whole purpose is to declare the Lord, and that's how we bear fruit for him. It's a beautiful analogy. I want to read to you another such passage that's even more beautiful, It's in Ezekiel chapter 31, and it's so poetic. And it's actually not calling God's people cedars of Lebanon. It was calling another country, Assyria. And spoiler alert, we're not going to read the full chapter, but the whole point of this passage is that the prophet Ezekiel is sort of setting up Assyria, saying, this is who you were, and now you're not that anymore, and this is bad. You used to be a cedar of Lebanon, but now you've lost that. But here's how Assyria is described in this beautiful, poetic prophecy of Ezekiel 31. Behold, Assyria was a cedar in Lebanon with beautiful branches and forest shade and of towering height, its top among the clouds. The waters nourished it. The deep made it grow tall, making its rivers flow around the place of its planting, sending forth its streams to all the trees of the field. So it towered high above all the trees of the field. Its boughs grew large and its branches long from abundant water in its shoots. All the birds of the heavens made their nests in its boughs. Under its branches, all the beasts of the field gave birth to their young. And under its shadow lived all great nations. It was beautiful in its greatness, in the length of its branches, for its roots went down to abundant waters. The cedars in the garden of God could not rival it, nor the fir trees equal its boughs. Neither were the plane trees like its branches. No tree in the garden of God was its equal in beauty. I made it beautiful in the mass of its branches, and all the trees of Eden envied it that were in the garden of God. I think that's a bold statement. You know, it, it takes us back to the Garden of Eden and says, all the other trees in the garden envied the cedar of Lebanon in its beauty, in its purposefulness, in its strength, and in its prosperity. The tree had deep roots. It talked about how it was able to get its nourishment from the waters beneath it. As its roots continued to go down into the ground, it, it found nourishment. That's important, Right? We know this with our own gardens. We know this with the own trees and our own properties that it's important that there's a good root system so that when the winds blow, it won't easily topple over. 
also so that when the conditions around it are not ideal, there's enough nutrients down beneath so those deep roots can get what it needs. But when we read this beautiful description of the cedar of Lebanon, it wasn't just how it was beautiful and strong and its roots were deep and it flourished. It also had a wide impact. It talked about how birds would build their nests in its boughs, how animals would give birth to their young underneath its branches. The impact of the cedar of Lebanon was broad-reaching. I will say it again. Real growth depends on right conditions for growing. And here's what we get to do. We can make wise choices now to create those conditions so that together we can grow deep and wide. I love the name of our church, Hickory Grove. I've always thought, man, whoever made that decision, whoever was a part of that, they were just ahead of their time. They didn't overthink it. We could spend like 30 minutes and I can just read to you a bunch of names of churches and there's some weird ones out there. There's some cool ones too. And then there's some that are like, whoa, what does that even mean, you know? Uh, but they, they acquired this property and on this property, I mean, I literally had someone tell me this like two months ago. Yeah, I remember there were hickory trees on the property. So someone said, you know, maybe we just call it Hickory Grove since we're planting a church amidst a grove of hickory trees. Yes, don't overthink it. That's a really good idea. And here we are today, 223 years later, still, I believe, making such a difference in the community, still growing, still hopefully living out God's purpose. He planted us here for a reason. And I love that that name is such a great analogy, like the cedar of Lebanon. Like a grove, a grove is a group of trees. Though they're individual, they exist together. They have probably even intertwining root systems that you don't necessarily see above ground, but they exist. We're all in this room right now. We're all together in this place, but represented here, all of you watching, listening online, all of you in this room, are very unique individual stories that God is writing. You're on a journey. And I know this, God's desire is for you and for me as individuals to take next steps with him to actually be growing, to deepening our root system and widening our impact for him. And we don't have to overthink it. We just got to become and let him have his way with us and not get in the way of what he wants to do in us. But I think what's beautiful about a church is that we're a grove of trees. We're, though existing with lots of individual stories, God is writing our story as a church together, these grove of trees coming together to worship together, to grow together, to serve together, to make a difference together. It's the beauty of this thing that we call a church. As it turns out, my job as your pastor is to help us figure out those right, wise choices to make to continue to ensure that the conditions are good for growth, both deep and wide. It's because of that that I want to talk to you about two initiatives. They're not brand new. One of them you already heard Missy talk about. And you've been hearing her talk about for a while. We've been talking about it for a while, for months. Here's the first one. We are doing rooted to get our hearts and minds in the right condition to live in rhythm with Jesus. When you sign up to be a part of rooted, you're saying, okay, I want to grow. And so I got to get my conditions correct. And those who are leaders of these Rooted groups, they went as a sort of a student of Rooted for 10 weeks. We as a staff did it for 10 weeks before they even did it. And I'm telling you, I'm really excited about the impact that this will have. I believe that by many of us, and we would love for everyone, as you heard Missy say already, we would love for everyone to, to take the opportunity to sign up for this. Because, and we already believe we're probably have like two to 300 people going through it, which is awesome. That is great. Imagine what God might be about to do as hundreds of people together say, I want to deepen my roots in the Word of God. 
I'm going to do that with others with me, alongside with me. To learn more about what God says in his word about us, about him, about his creation, about his salvation. And one of the things that we'll talk about, because we're going to be doing sermons that sort of form a companion to the study for those same 10 weeks. And one of the things you'll hear us talk a lot about are the seven rhythms that this curriculum teaches. And it's not rocket science. It's things that you've already heard us talk about, like prayer and worship and things like that. But that these are are supposed to be a regular rhythm in our life. And that as we lean into living out those rhythms, our roots deepen. And you can't even begin to measure the impact of that. When you do that, you grow. You Deeper roots allows you to get through things that are not always easy because your roots, roots are deep and embedded in God's will and in those rhythms of following Jesus. That's why this is so important. And this is, it's easy to think that churches and maybe even pastors like me like really care about the numbers, how many did this, how many did that. And I do care about those because for every number, that represents an actual soul created by God. That's why I'm excited. Yeah, I'm excited that there were 21 people that told their story through baptism last week saying, God is making me new and I believe in him and he is my Savior and he is my Lord and he is my friend. That is a God thing worth celebrating. Yeah, I'm pumped about that. But friends, we were not meant to just grow wide. We were absolutely meant to grow deep. He wants us to become He wants to make you into his image. He wants you to become more and more like the child of God that he created you and died on the cross for you and I to become. That's one initiative. Here's the second one. This is really logistical. We brought this up way back in August and showed some pictures about it, and I'm going to show you another one in a little bit, but here's the second one. We are asking you to band together to move our worship space to the gym so that as we go deep, we have room to continue to go wide. If there's any of our three services that are like, I can almost aim in that, it's probably this one. Because uh, it hurts our hearts when we have to, when you come in and we have to kind of sometimes split your family party up into two different sections. And we have seen people say, I might come to a different service or I might just come next week. And ah. Uh, We never want that to be a barrier for people to be able to come and worship and grow together. Four walls, brick and mortar. Though I appreciate it, especially on a day like today, I love brick and mortar. I love HVAC. At the end of the day, you never want it to be the reason that growth is limited. We talked about this back in August during a sermon series called The One About the Jars. And we talked about how sometimes jars just have to be broken. And and I want to lean into that a little bit with you today. Before I I, I share with you some pictures that go along with what brought us to this decision to present this to you, I want to invite you, if you're like, man, i got lots of questions about that. We're going to have a town hall meeting tonight in this very room at 6 p.m. And I'm going to present again some of what I'm about to present to you with maybe a little extra information. But that's just an opportunity for people to ask any questions. So if you got any at all, you're invited to come to that. It doesn't matter if this is your first time here or your millionth time here. You're invited to come to that tonight at 6. But let me walk you through what brought us to this point. We're always trying to think ahead about what God might be about to do with what he's given us. We're very blessed to have 43 acres of property, most of which is completely undeveloped. And so, as we know, we've been dealing with space issues for a while. Uh, It's a great problem to have. We're thinking, well, what's the next phase of building? In fact, we already had a 10-year plan before we did our remodel, which got finished in 2018, the remodel of the Family Life Center and the adult wing here. We already had a plan to build an atrium and then build an ex-worship center, and it was going to maybe be at least 10 years in that whole process. However, as we started looking at our property and thinking about things like, mm, we might want to rethink all of this. The location of the worship center was going to be pretty close to Taylor Mill Road, and there's some pretty uh, risky things with that, you building that close to the road. So we hired an engineering firm, and we talked a lot with them. And they helped us to form a new site plan. I want to show that to you today and and orient you a little bit to this. 
Uh, Taylor Mill Road, which is the road you drove on to get into the parking lot, is on the bottom. So south is down. Uh, no, wait. North is down. South is up on this picture. And you can see that to the left in the grayish rectangles, that is the worship center that we're in right now. And you can see to the top there, our daycare, family life center, um, youth and kids space is on the top in that building, connected by this breezeway that some of you walk across every Sunday. What you see is the footprint to the right of where a new lobby and worship center would be built. This is the most ideal location so that parking, the furthest parking spot, isn't too far away from an actual worship entrance. It allows us to not be too close to Taylor Mill Road, which could have been some zoning issues, could be some future problems if Taylor Mill Road is ever widened. And we need this. God has given us this property for a reason to develop it. However, as it turns out, we don't currently have the financial budget to be able to do this yet. Yet we're growing. We have lots of growing pains in this very room. And that's why that we talked about this back in August. and We said we're going to be continue to pray about it and watch and see what God is doing. And I believe, as your senior pastor, that we must do something about our space issue. As it turns out, the biggest room on this entire property almost never gets used on Sundays, our gym. And that's what I propose that we move our worship gatherings to. And I'll show you a picture of that. A big thank you to John Hughes, one of our bass guitarists, who also has the skill set to do an actual rendering based on the measurements of the chairs, the dimensions of the gym, that we will be able to fit 500 seats in our gym. Based on our current attendance, we could go down to two worship gatherings and still have room to grow by at least 50% in that space. That's how big of a move this would be for us. I could bore you with a lot of things I've learned over the years from church growth experts about once you reach 65% capacity, you better have a plan in place to make more room for growth. Once you reach 80%, just kind of like we are right now in this room, then you're way past due to do something about your space issue. That's why there's a sense of urgency with this. So we're literally asking you to do this together. I think this is a family decision. This is a church decision. That's why we're doing something, uh, making it a business meeting issue. We're literally going to vote on this as a church, as a part of our worship gatherings next week. Last time we did this, it was for the big remodel we did that got finished in 2018. I think it requires such a rally around the vision that we want to handle it in this way. In our last business meeting of 2023, I read into the minutes of our business meeting the motion that I submit to you as a church. And I want to read it for you right now. After consultation with the ministerial staff, the trustees, and the treasurer of Hickory Grove Baptist Church, I move that we utilize our current savings account to make all necessary purchases for the purpose of moving our weekly worship services to our Family Life Center gymnasium beginning on the weekend of Easter, which is March 31st, 2024. I shared with the business meeting last month that our estimate, and I'm really grateful for all the hard behind-the-scenes legwork that Tim Blake, our next-gen worship minister, has done to help us to know the cost of this. The estimated cost is $129,000, and it won't even deplete half of our current savings that we have. And that just reminds me that God has provided a way. As we look around to what he's given us, I believe he's already given us the solution that allows us to, to continue to grow wide while we also continue to grow deep. Probably the biggest question I've gotten when we introduced this in August is, okay, I've been in that gym. I've been in gyms. How in the world can that be turned into a worship center? I will tell you that if any of you have ever attended a church plant, kind of a newer church, or a church that's multi-site, which has multiple campuses. I mean, this is their bread and butter every single week for years and years on end. This is what they do. All over the planet right now, there were people that got up really early and converted a gym into a worship center. And then after the service was over, flipped it back to a gym. 
And it can be done and is being done all the time. I'll show you a little picture of just, I think this is very similar to what our gym will kind of look like when we're in there worshiping. It doesn't look that much different at all. We'll be doing sound work in there to keep the, to remove all of the echo. That's something that we actually voted in a business meeting to do already to prepare for rooted classes. Because until we were to make this move, we need to use that gym for rooted classes. We're going to put four classes using dividing walls and have sound panels in there so that we can uh, effectively have those classes in there. And then... Lord willing, we're in the gym worshiping Easter weekend. This room becomes a place that can be used for those classes and small groups as well on Sunday mornings. At this hour, we're completely out of space for small groups, so that would really, really help us. This is what's happening all over the planet already, what you see in that picture. Our friends at Seven Hills Church, such a great church in northern Kentucky, they get up really early down at Grant County High School and unload a big tractor trailer and convert a room in that high school into worship space and then afterwards flip it back. It's what's done. And it's going to definitely take work. It's going to take effort. We're going to need volunteers uh, to be able to do this. I'll talk to you a little bit more about that next week. But I'm telling you, I believe God has given us the vision and the provision. It's just up to us to make the choice. It's up to us to make a wise choice to create the right conditions to grow both deep and wide. Years ago, before even the pandemic happened, our church staff was going to monthly meetings in Dry Ridge. Uh, and it was a lot of different, I don't know how many churches were represented, but there were a lot of different churches in central and northern Kentucky. And the organization that was leading the meetings was an organization called Oxano. And uh, Will Mancini kind of started that. And it was the whole idea behind it is to help churches know their community better and to understand and to be able to uh, catch a vision for how that church was planted in that community to meet those very unique needs in that community. It was very invigorating meetings. We got a lot out of it. But I remember they gave an analogy early on in that year of meetings that we had with them. And I've never forgotten it. They talked about a farmer who uh, grew pumpkins. And what the farmer did out of curiosity was to, when the first little buds were forming on the vines, he took a jar. Uh, with a real skinny little neck to it. And he shoved that little sprout from the pumpkin down into the jar and put the vine down in there too so that it was in the bottom of the jar. Just kind of curious what would happen to that pumpkin placed in a clear jar. And I know where my mind would go. I would think, well, it's going to grow like a pumpkin and eventually bust that jar open. Turns out that's not what happened. What ended up happening is that that pumpkin grew into the exact shape of that jar and stopped growing. When you break the jar, the farmer breaks the jar, you got a jar-shaped pumpkin that no longer grows. That's what happened. And the folks at Oxano said, this is actually what we see happening in so many churches. They grow to a point And they don't recognize that they need to make some wise decisions, sometimes hard decisions, and break jars, if you will, in order to continue to fulfill its purpose, in order for it to have room to continue to grow and allow God to do what God has been doing in it. So I'll be honest with you. I remembered that analogy being in the meeting in Dry Ridge, but I couldn't remember all the details. So I started doing my Google search to Will Mancini's book and Oxano and looking, okay, yeah, it was a pumpkin. I couldn't remember thinking it was a pumpkin. Yeah, it was a pumpkin. Well, in my research of doing all that, I found another thing that just kind of blew me away. I was like, whoa, this is different. This is interesting. There is a distillery in Ashford, Connecticut that makes a drink called Pear in the Bottle Brandy. And this is what it looks like. Cool looking, pretty. It takes apparently a really long time to make. But the way they make it is very similar to the analogy we learned from Oxano. I'll show you this picture. They will literally take those heart-shaped jars that you see, and before the pear gets too big, they'll put that little sprout of the pear down into that bottle and tie that bottle to that branch. That's how they make them. And then there's a whole other process that eventually gets it to this kind of cool-looking product that people will buy. 
Now, the reason that I thought this was very interesting enough to share with you today is it might be hard to read the bottle there, but this is the name of this product that they sell. The name of this product, I'm going to try to get this right, is Poix Prisonnier. That's some good Appalachian French right there. Poix Prisonnier. I actually had to really research that online to get it somewhat close to how you say it. You know what that means? Imprisoned pair. Pair in jail is what this means. <laughs> and it's such a, like a cool-looking product for it to be named in such a way. But I think this, re this really spoke to me because I'm like, you know what? It's a cool thing. It's a neat thing that they did that, and I understand that. But at the end of the day, you can't, you can't deny the fact that they robbed a pear of its purpose. <laughs> you can't eat that pear. That pear's seeds will never end up being planted into the ground to produce another pear tree. It was repurposed for something completely different. It might be cool. It might be neat. It might even look pretty. It may be delicious. I don't know. But it wasn't fulfilling its purpose. And I just think to myself, that is a great analogy of churches also. If we're not careful, we can look at where things are and say, that's cool, that's neat, that's different, and I like it. And we settle to just stay there. I mean, all the time, there could be more growth. There's even a greater purpose and a bigger story that God wants to write. And we have to say, you know what, that's neat, that's cool, but let's not put a lid on what God is doing. Let's get out of his way and let him continue to do what he's doing. Man, I love where we are right now. I love what God has been doing. I love the deep history of Hickory Grove. I've been blessed to see it firsthand for 25, almost 26 years now. I love the story of where we once were. But if we stay there, friends... We're like a pumpkin in a jar that will one day stop growing. We're like a pear in prison that will one day not fulfill its ultimate purpose. I do believe we got to make hard yet wise choices in order to continue to grow deep and wide. Here are the two steps I ask you to consider. First, make room in your life for God to grow you. Get granular. Think about you, where you are spiritually, and consider potentially signing up for Rooted if you're not already signed up. And, and I want to almost give a disclaimer, like, if you, for some reason that just doesn't work out with your schedule, I get that. But you still need to focus on your spiritual growth. Take next steps. Be in his word. Commit yourself to growing with other people. Because that's God's will for your life. And that's how you deepen your roots spiritually. And if we're doing that together, man, we're going to experience something that we can't even imagine that God wants to do in us. Secondly, help us make room on this campus to grow his family here at the Grove. Next week, we will, though we'll, also, we'll be definitely in worship, we'll also technically be in business because near the end of each service, we will invite all the members of Hickory Grove to literally put a ballot in a receptacle down front here before you leave. It'll be anonymous. There'll be ballots in each of the chair backs that you'll be able to grab and look at it. It'll have the motion that I read to you written out on it. You'll be able to vote yes or no to it and put it in. If you're wondering, like, am I a member? If you've been baptized here, you're a member. If you ever fill out a membership form, and have experienced believers' baptism, you're a member here. Some of y'all are like, man, I've been a member here so long, I don't even have to think about it. That's cool too. But that's what I ask you to do. If you're here and you're like, I'm not a member, so I guess this doesn't apply to me. No, I ask you, please, catch the vision for this too. Pray. Pray for me, your pastor. Pray for this church. Pray for all of us to catch a vision for what God wants to do. Because, friends, this is not my church. This is not our church. This is God's church. And it's not a business. It's not an organization. What makes the church so unique is it's actually a living, growing thing. It's a grove of trees. It's an organism. God calls it the body of Christ and the bride of Christ. 
it's different. In living things, healthy things, thriving things grow. I invite you, let's make choices now that will allow us to become everything God wants us to become, to grow deep and wide for his glory, not ours. We're going to sing one more song of worship. I'm going to invite you to stand. And before we sing this, let's pray. Let's ask God to speak to each of our hearts and lead us to do what he has called us to do. Will you stand with me as we pray together? Father, we stand before you now, and I say to you, O Lord, your will be done. May I or anyone else not be in the way of the work that you want to accomplish in and through us. Father, I know that you are helping us to become, that you want to deepen our roots. I pray that, Lord, you would help us to take whatever next steps each of us as individuals need to take to experience the growth that you desire us to experience. Father, also, I believe you've led me to the point to lead our church to make this big move, moving our worship gatherings to another room. Father, I ask you to continue to reveal to each of our hearts if that is from you. And that if that is from you, oh God, that we would courageously take that step and trust you with what you will do next. Father, thank you for bringing us together to be a grove of trees, deepening in our roots together, raising up our boughs and worship to you together. Father, have your way with us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.